Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us. You are at uh, Sonoma Land Trust monthly webinar series, Language of the Land. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about otters, spotting otters around the bay. Before we begin, I'd like to let you all know that this presentation is being interpreted into Spanish. If you would like to join the Spanish channel, please click on the world icon at the bottom of right of your screen and select Spanish. If you're on a phone, you can click the three dots and choose your language from there. You want me to say the message in Spanish, Neil? Ah, uh, sí. Just in case. A todos los que deseen escuchar esta reunión en español, tienen la opción de hacerlo haciendo clic en un icono que va a aparecer ahora en un ratito. Eh, y si no, si están en un teléfono, lo pueden hacer haciendo clic en tres puntitos. Ahí va a salir la opción de español. Gracias. Thank you, Neil. Gracias. A uh, big thank you to Mariana at MR Translations for joining us. And again, at the bottom right-hand side, you see a little world icon that says interpretation. Go ahead and select Spanish. Um, so before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping for everyone. Uh, the presentation is scheduled for about an hour, which will be followed up with a 30-minute question and answer session at the end. You can submit your questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. I encourage you to submit it along the presentation, not just at the end, but you can also submit questions during the Q&A session itself. We will not be monitoring the chat for questions for the question and answer session, so make sure to put it in the Q&A. Thank you. The Sonoma Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects land in Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976 and have protected over 58,000 acres in our county so far. We accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors. So thanks to all of you out there for helping us protect beautiful Sonoma County for future generations. As we pursue our mission of conserving land throughout Sonoma County, we recognize that our work happens upon the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples and tribes. We want to take a moment to honor their knowledge, their care and stewardship of this special place across the ages and acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted upon them. We at Sonoma Land Trust want to embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their cultural and traditional connections to the land. I encourage all of you to learn more about your local indigenous tribes, and you can start by visiting native-land.ca. And with that, I would like to introduce our presenter for the evening, uh, Megan Isidore. You there, Megan? There you are. Uh, Megan Isidore is the co-founder and executive director of the River Ecology Project. She works on conservation based on science, community, and public education. Megan worked as a medical writer and a risk manager until her interest took a rapid and sharp turn towards conservation when she moved to Marin in 1998. Since then, she has dedicated her time and efforts to watershed conservation, usually in concert with working on the recovery of endangered or recovering species like salmon and River Otters. Megan, it's so lovely to have you here and thank you for spending your evening with us. I'd like to turn it over to you to learn all about otters in our home. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you so much to Sonoma Land Trust for having me. And thank you to Mariana for interpreting. And I'm just getting myself together, here we are. And tonight, I have a treat because otters, everybody loves otters, obviously. How could they not? Look at that gorgeous creature you're seeing on your screen right now. River otters are not just gorgeous and fun to watch and entertaining, but they're a really, really interesting animal. And they were gone from the Bay Area for a long time. Their recovery is telling us quite a bit about the watersheds that we all inhabit and about connections within those watersheds. As an ecologist and a conservationist, I'm all about the connections. I follow connections and I spend my time exploring the web that connects us all to support the planet. We are very grateful to be connected to you through Zoom today. 
and through our mission to support watershed health through otters, community science, research, and education. And we are, of course, grateful to the Coast and Bay Miwok, the Ohlone tribes, the Wapo, and the Pomo for stewarding the unceded land that we live and work on for their soul deep understanding and for upholding those connections despite appalling trials. Those are community connections that we try to honor and to emulate. Once upon a time, there were river otters all over the Bay Area. But by the 20th century, otter sightings became less frequent and then they disappeared completely in many places. Otter decline is happening throughout the world to all 13 species of otters, except for North American river otters, which is what we're talking about tonight. And their decline is caused by the usual culprits with semi-aquatic creatures, loss of wetland habitat, trapping and pollution. So of course it is no different here. Our story tonight is about the unexpected return of this gorgeous little predator. And look at them. Usually when I do this in person, I just have to stop because there's too much oohing and ooing and awing during this part. But I can just carry on as though no one is uh, <laughs> doing anything but listening to me. So the, present, the otter presence is about how paying attention to what's going on in our own backyards can literally change maps and changing maps changes management and planning and changing management and planning for wild species, especially now can change the world. And we can all participate in that through community science. So as we started studying the otters, we came to have questions about their recovery in the Bay Area and how it might affect our shared watersheds and what otter presence can tell us about the state of our watersheds. So this all did start with salmon recovery on Lagunitas Creek in Marin County. I and my co-founders were working on that in Lagunitas Creek. We started seeing otters popping up in the creek more than usual. And we said, what's going on? What's going on with these otters? Are we seeing more? Are there more? Started looking into it. And we discovered that there was a big data gap concerning um, river otters in the Bay Area. So we decided that we would use their charm to advertise and popularize their return. We would link their return to cleaner watersheds and we would back this up with selected research. So I'll give you a little background here. Historically, our species, Lantra canadensis, were present throughout North America. But trapping, as I said, pollution, loss of wetlands sent them to local extinction in many areas all over North America. And in fact, they were gone for large um, parts of the United States and Canada for a very long time. And mostly that was caused by trapping. But here in the Bay Area, there was trapping, but not so much of it. Pollution, loss of wetlands sent them to local ex extinction almost in the um, Bay Area. In 1970, the Clean Air Act passed again, an updated Clean Air Act passed. In 1972, the Clean Water Act passed. And that, those are the primary federal laws governing water and air pollution. And then on the more local front, positive change came in 1974 with the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge in the South Bay, our first urban National Wildlife Refuge dedicated to preserving and enhancing wildlife habitat, protecting migratory birds and threatened and endangered species, and providing opportunities for nature recreation. So these changes are just some of the many that paved the way in the San Francisco Bay Area for pollution control and watershed restoration, Habitats started be, to become more livable for otters and lots of other wildlife. And many places throughout the United States began reintroductions of otters. And here, our story takes a leap because here, oops, I went the wrong direction. Sorry about that. Go backwards. 
Here our story takes a leap because here in the Bay Area, otters were not reintroduced and tracked and nobody was paying a lot of attention to them until we began our project in 2012. Otters um, were not so affected by fur trapping as I mentioned, but there was no real major effort to track or study otters because they weren't endangered or threatened. So this range map, the pink area, is the otter range map as of 1995, and it hadn't been updated when we started our work in 2012. Now we knew that otters were present in the in bays and creeks in Marin. You see down here in Marin, no otters, apparent according to what was known at that time. So we thought it's time to update this map. Let's look into it. And we started with our web portal called Otter Spotter, which I'll talk about mostly tonight. And we also started a focal research study area in Marin County, where we started to monitor population changes and we began baseline um, diet and genetic studies. The Otter Spotter pro project began as a regional Bay Area project, and it has spread out significantly, including most of California, as well as sightings from all over the United States and into Canada and some from other countries as well. And it's become so popular. In fact, it's been really successful. And we have been invited to France this um, September to present to the Otter Specialist Group of the IUCN, the International Union for conservation of nature to um, talk about how we started this project and encourage other um, European and Asian countries to do something similar. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, our web portal. If you, and I have a call to action for you too, if you see an otter wherever it is, whether it's in California or in uh, a giant river otter in Ecuador, we want you to come to our website, go onto our sightings map and submit your river otter sightings. It's not hard to do. The, um, you can do it on your phone. The website will take you to something that looks like this and you will just pin your sighting on the map. Now for us, the most important thing about pinning your sighting is to zoom down as close as you can get to that um, map point because otherwise your sighting shows up way, way over there and we can't tell where it is. So if you can zoom in and pin that sighting, that is how we have changed the range map with people like you and others all over the Bay Area inputting their sightings one by one. So the sightings um, map asks a few things about the otters and to identify where you saw them, when you saw them, how many you saw, um, whether you're sure it's an otter or not, and if at all possible, we like people to send in photo or video. And we are not picky. If it's not an otter, that's okay. Otters are kind of hard to see. They're small. They're surprisingly small for how long they are, but they're pretty small. They're dark animals, like many other aquatic mammals. If you see them in the water, you might not think they're, you might be unsure as to what they are. That's okay. Send those pictures and sightings in anyway, and we sort them out. If we're not sure if it's an otter or a muskrat or something else, then we can just look at the picture and we can usually um, tell. So not to worry, do send your sightings in. Um, so that web portal has been up for 10 years now. We are about to get to our 5,000th sighting, which is pretty amazing. Um, only 97 of those sightings are mortalities reported. Most of them are hit by cars. River otters get hit by cars quite often, unfortunately. And that a lot of that is because we have so many roads that and highways that go along waterways. I mean, it's the San Francisco Bay Area. River otters are small, they're dark, they're often active at night, and they're really quick, and they dart out and they get hit a lot. So what do we do about that? We do collect those sightings, all the red dots on this map are river otter carcasses that have been found, almost all of them on the road. And we work with the, uh, the um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the California Academy of Sciences, and we collect otter carcasses 
for necropsy or um, animal autopsy. And that gives us some information that we wouldn't get otherwise about the otters. Thus far, interestingly, we have found low levels of rodenticides in several otters. Um, usually they're killed by the car strike rather than um, anything else, but they, they are susceptible to some diseases and certainly to um, rodenticides. The rodenticides that we found in their bodies were low levels, which is not enough to kill them or make them sick, but they're there. And that means that those rodenticides are either in the prey species that they're eating or else in the water, which is even scarier. So um, these necropsies are very important to us and we work, work hard to collect the carcasses, a grisly but necessary task. We also send in this car strike information to the, um, the CRAS, CROSS, the California Roadkill Observation System out of UC Davis. They collect car strike information, not just on river otters, but on all species of animals in um, California. And I think they also now do it in Rhode Island too. They have one other state on their um, list at this time. And they collect that information to help inform policy management and financial investments in reducing road kill. I think a lot of you have probably heard about the amazing um, road crossing that's being built in Southern California now in the LA area to support the um, mountain lions and other species as well. Those are the kinds of things that cross, with, um, that cross helps. So check them out someday when you have time. Um, it's wildlifecrossings.net. So as you saw, um, let me go back to that slide. Look at the San Francisco Bay Area. Lots and lots of yellow dots all over the Bay Area in the um, North Bay, in the East Bay. But then when we move down toward the South Bay, our sightings get sparser and sparser. Now, we have surveyed on foot and um, mostly on foot all of this area on the west coast south of San Francisco to look for otters, to look for otter track and sign, and to look for um, otter habitat to see whether otters could do well here. And there's a lot of great habitat along the coast. Otters are really happy on the coast. They do great in the ocean as long as they have some fresh water. And we're not finding otters. All these yellow dots on the map are definite otter sightings. Down in Fremont in Coyote Hills Regional Park, which is this area, we've done a lot of surveying and, and seen otters down there and seen lots of otter sign. Not so much it's in the South Bay, although all those blue dots down here are also otter sightings that have come into us. But those sightings um, are not verifiable because they don't have photos or video. So when we can't be absolutely sure it's an otter that people are seeing, it's not that we don't believe it, um, but we can't use that data yet. But all that means to us is we have to do more work down there. So we have done a lot of surveys down there. We've gotten the word out quite a bit in the South Bay and as well as in the San Mateo area, Redwood City area. So we're, we are watching for that information to come in. We recently have a wonderful woman named Connie who has a detection dog who sniffs for otter scat. And she has been looking at the places where we haven't seen otters and she is gonna help us. And if her dog can find scat, then sooner or later, we will find a photo of a river otter. So continuing our quest to find out exactly how far along the San Francisco, I mean, along the um, California coast, how far south Otter Range actually goes. So more on that, I hope, in the not too distant future. So a few years ago now, we contributed our data set to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in an effort to update um, the range map. So as you may recall, the original range map is this light pink area. We sent in there our data set and 
after some time went by and everything was verified, we, um, the CDFW added 4,100 square miles to river, uh, the official River Otter Range. So that all this darker area that you see here is River Otter Official Range Map now. And you'll notice that the San Francisco Bay area, which is small here, but the purple is the San Francisco Bay. San Francisco Bay area is now fully within official river otter range. So we'll talk about what that means and why we care about that in a second. But first, let's talk about Sonoma. So Sonoma is really interesting. Apparently river otters never entirely disappeared from Sonoma County and nor certainly from Contra Costa County. We believe that they repopulated the Bay Area, especially into Marin and the um, South and the East Bay from both Sonoma and the Sacramento Delta. In order to find out for sure how otters repopulated, we need robust genetic studies and lots of them. We have made a start on those studies and we inch our way forward on those as funds become. What we have learned from what we've done is that there are multiple groups of river otters related by matrilines in Marin. And matrilines mean they come from the same mother, but they're separate groups. They don't all come from the same mother who's related to and her sister and so on. They come, they, there are several different groups in Marin. So this indicates to us that Marin otters are not the result of a single family of otters entering Marin County. And the fact that river otter groups were seen for the first time simultaneously in the late 80s in Walker Creek near Tomales Bay and at Rodeo Lagoon in the Marin Headlands supports our theory that there were multiple avenues of return. But as I say, we're not really gonna know the answer to that until we do more genetic studies. So I'm showing you this map again in a different format. This is the Department of Fish and Wildlife's BIOS map, which is really interesting. Take a stroll around BIOS someday. They have many layers and many interesting things to discover. But I, I'm showing you this um, map again because I wanna mention that these maps don't indicate anything except for presence of otters. They don't necessarily indicate absence of otters. For example, you see in the center of this map in along Highway uh, 5 is a big donut hole. And we thought, well, maybe there are otters there. We don't know. All we know is that no one has seen them and reported them to our range map. We did send our detection dog buddy out there and she was able to find what she is pretty sure is otter scat out there. We saw photos of it. Her dog thought it was otter scat. It looks pretty ottery. So there may very well be otters there we don't know about. So all of this is to say that these maps tell us that there are otters that have been reported to us. We know there are otters in these places, but it, we don't know how many they are, if they're thriving, if they're not thriving. There's just so much um, to figure out, and it's a lot of fun to do. So if we do find more otters, which we expect to, we'll add them to our data set, and they will contribute to the next iteration of the range map. So here's one of my favorite otters. She's one I know very well. She lives in Point Reyes National Seashore. We call her Mrs. Fierce because she is an incredible hunter. River otters are quite comfortable and happy to hunt in the ocean. The ocean has lots of big prey for them. They're small animals and they have thick, thick fur, but they're mammals who spend a lot of time in the water, much like any marine mammal, but they don't have that thick layer of fat that marine mammals have. 
So river otters need a lot of food to keep their energy up, to keep them warm in that cold water, and they eat a lot of food. So this otter is carrying a thornback ray or a guitar fish. She catches them all the time. They're pretty slow and easy to catch. They're opportunistic predators, meaning they catch what is slow and easy to get. So Mrs. Fierce has been known not only to catch many guitar fish and other fish and drag it in across the beach back to her pups that live in a pond or near a pond um, far behind the beach, but she has also been known to bring in a, uh, a uh, leopard shark and a gray smoothhound shark, drag them into the culvert. We have video of a big fight between her and the shark in the culvert after she had dragged it in. But you can't really see, all you can see is a lot of thrashing around. And then not too much longer later, she comes out of the culvert dragging half a leopard shark, uh, half the uh, gray smooth down shark. And she drags it all the way back to her pups that are a little ways um, back in the bushes waiting. So river otters are very fierce and interesting predators. They're top of the food web. They're vulnerable to environmental contaminants. And of course, they're gonna be affected by climate change and sea level rise. So understanding otters current range, as well as the changes that happen during the next decades can help us with provide a measure of changing watershed conditions. So the kinds of people who need and want to understand river otter range include those who work with natural resources like our national and state parks folks, restorations, spill response, wildlife rehab, the wildlife crossings people I told you about, wildlife disease surveillance like the Department of Fish and Wildlife who does the necropsies on river otters for us, fire, and advocacy for our shared watersheds and wildlands. And I'll give you a few examples of those things. Here you see another map. You see we're all about maps here. Another map of the Bay Area showing um, some of the habitat projects and restoration projects that are going along. And as you see, there are a lot of them all over the Bay Area. And people who are working on projects to protect habitat, to restore habitat, really need to understand what animals are, um, what animals, plants, and so on inhabit the areas they're working on. So I'm going to mention two, the two projects that we have done that are supporting those kinds of projects. The first was at Mount View Sanitary District in, um, in uh, Martinez. And we worked there for a couple of years. Uh, the sanitary district is um, situated between a big, big marsh that goes onto, uh, that is attached to the strait. And there are also, the, um, then there's the reclamation ponds for the sanitary district with a lovely marsh around it. And then there is the um, oil refinery right next door. But interestingly enough, this oil refinery was kind of a good place for wildlife because it was completely fenced. Nobody could get in, nobody bothered them. And there was a fence um, with a creek that ran under the fence in between the reclamation ponds and the refinery. So there was a big group of otters that used that area. They went between the marsh and the reclamation ponds and the refinery. And there was a female there who became pregnant during the time we were working. Now, what was happening was that the reclamation ponds were going to be drained and restored. And all the vegetation was taken and taken out, everything was cut down. So our, our job was to help to understand how the otters were using that area so that we could protect them and mitigate as much as we could for the restoration project. And I'm really happy to say that, that working with Mount Dew Sanitary Dist District was a dream because they really cared and they really supported our request to put fences in different places and to do the best they could to monitor situations. And we were out there monitoring as well to, um, to keep our cameras up during the whole 
restoration project, which went on for about a year. And um, it, was, it was wonderful. So Mrs., uh, the, the female river otter there who was pregnant did end up having pups. And I'm happy to say that she and her pups all did very well throughout that time. So really important for people who were doing restoration um, projects to understand what animals are there and how they use areas and, um, and use that information for the best for the animals. So another example of that is at Muir Woods. Redwood Creek, as we know, runs through Muir Woods and down to, uh, down to the beach. And uh, not too long ago, Muir, uh, uh, Muir Woods did a beautiful restoration project down at Stinson Beach, not Stinson, um, Muir Beach down there. And when they were doing, part of what they were doing that restoration for was of course, to support the, the dwindling, teetering salmon population of Redwood Creek. Those, that population is nearly extinct and they are teetering so much that the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the um, National Marine Fisheries Services and others got together and came up with a plan to try to save that important population of coho salmon. And what they did was go to Redwood Creek and collect all of the salmon that they could from that creek, all of the fry, the tiny salmon, and take them to a hatchery, raise them, until they were ready to spawn again and then return them to um, Redwood Creek. Now, when you're doing something like that with these animals that are really just teetering on the brink of winking out, you really wanna know, are there otters there who are just going to chow on them when they are settled? So we have spent 10 years monitoring Redwood Creek and watching the otter population there. There, there are otters there, but not many, thank goodness. And during the times that the fisheries folks are putting the salmon into the water, we, we um, let them know what's going on and as much as we know. So th those are the kinds of things that are really important for our restoration managers to understand. And now something near to and dear, I know to all of your hearts. Um, advocacy. We do, we are an, a research and education project um, and we care deeply about advocacy and we wish we had the staff and the time to do more of it, but we do it when we can. And a lot of that um, is a result of knowing where the otters are. On this map, you see all those orange spots are otter sightings. And we heard about the uh, the uh, Sonoma Development Center specific plan EIR comment letters were required. So we sent in a comment letter and we were able to say, look at this um, stream, river otters are present and they move through that stream network that flows into San Pablo Bay. So knowledge of otter presence and use of the entire corridor and beyond, as you see, only bolsters our understanding of the need for intact wildlife corridors. Now we are coming to this very near and dear to my heart. And part of it is about the science, understanding the food web. I've been talking a lot about webs and I always talk about webs and the food web of river otters is fascinating and it's important. A lot of people think that river otters eat only fish. Not so, river otters will eat any protein they can get their little teeth and claws around. And that includes fish, shellfish, birds, um, rodents, lots of insects, all kinds of critters, any protein, they're not choosy, tons of crayfish. And of course they'll, they'll eat um, coho salmon if, you can, if they can get them. There's a couple of juvenile coho salmon at the top left. Tidewater gopi, another um, endangered species in uh, Point Mays, in Tomales Bay, which is, uh, and Point Mays National Seashore, which is where we did our prey study. But there's another side to this. They're not only voracious predators on our 
beloved endangered species, but just like any voracious predator, they will also eat all of the non-native crayfish they can get, which are easy for them to catch. They eat those um, pesky green crabs. So they're also happy to eat pest species. Their diets are seasonal. Um, and our prey study helped us to understand what a really broad range of foods river otters ate. Before we did this baseline study, the only studies done in, um, in the Bay Area about river otters, what river otters eat was a study at Rodeo Lagoon, which looked into all the many pelicans that river otters were eating. Yes, they do eat pelicans. They're pretty fierce for such small um, animals. And uh, the other study showed that river otters, when they can get uh, crayfish, will eat almost all crayfish because they're really easy to catch. And I've watched them eat crayfish a million times. They eat them like potato chips, crunch, 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 just easy to get. So the other part of this prey study is really fun. And it was the beginning of a wonderful relationship that we have with a local under-resourced school, Tamales High School in Tamales, California. Um, the high school is a wonderful school, very small. Um, it's, a, it's a school district that goes all along the coast. It's a long, narrow school district. So the kids get bused a long way for their work. And they weren't they, and it's remote. It's way out in West Marin. So the students were not necessarily able to get a lot of the um, really great stuff that goes on in Marin for high school students. So we started working with them. And we've done that for several years now. And here are some of um, our students working on the prey study with us. So part of the goal that we have for working with these students is to help them understand what, what science is, what scientists do. You know, we're, we are kind of egg-heady, but we don't just sit behind our computers. Uh, they understand that we're out there in the field and we take them out in the field with us. We take them kayaking. We worked in the lab with them on this study. So it's been great. And it's a way of encouraging the students to understand what science is, how it works, why it's important, and that they too can continue their education if they want to and become scientists. Um, spill preparation re and response, something that I never thought that much about before we started working with the otters, but then the Costco Busan oil um, spill came along in, I think it was in 2007, something like that. It was before our project started. But after that oil spill, um, which was near the Golden Gate Bridge, river otters were seen eating oiled birds and oil was found in their um, fecal samples later. However, there was no plan for river otters. There was no understanding that they were there and there was no way to figure out whether the oil spill had affected their populations in that area or not. So it's very, very important for the CDFW Department of, and um, uh, the CDF California Department of Fish and Wildlife's oil spill response team to, and not just oil, but spill response team to understand where um, animals are in the areas that they look at. Now, um, the oil spill response team is responsible not just for oil spills, but for any kind of toxic spills throughout California, not just along the coast. So all the green lines here on the map are rail lines that carry toxic materials all the time. And you can see this tanker vessel traffic goes in and out of the bay and way up into the delta all the time. And all of those um, purple, purple triangles are otter sightings. So um, offering that information to the oil spill folks is really important, important for them to have. All right, now you all know about wildfires. We all know about wildfires. Um, as we all know, wildfires are a constant menace and that's not going to change. They kill and displace wildlife for sure. They pollute land, 
and water and food sources. So understanding how otters move during and after a fire, like with all species, can support better understanding of how to protect not just those wildlife, but corridors for wildlife to move um, through when they have to. The yellow dots on here are otter sightings from 2012 through, um, through currently. And I want to show you some of the sightings that we have had in fire burned areas since the fires were put out. So the top, oops, the top left, the top left um, is, the top left map is from 2021 at Mark West Creek. I don't think that actually got burned, but I, or maybe it did. Someone will tell me after this. Um, but we have seen more, we've been getting more and more sightings of otters there, which is very interesting as well. Um, Sugarloaf Ridge State Park is an area where they have a critter cam and we get sightings from them from time to time. So that definitely burned, but we have seen otters in 2021 there. And in another sighting on the bottom left in 2021. And then there's one right in Calistoga at Hans Faden Vineyards, which are good friends of ours. And you'll hear later about Hans Faden Vineyards, but that was almost within the burn area, but the vineyards, thank goodness, did not burn and they've seen otters there. So for, for us to understand that after fires, there are otters coming back and getting this information is incredibly helpful. Of course, without going out and doing major work um, after fires, we're not really sure, before and after fires, we can't really be sure how um, the otters did Post fire. And part of that is because in order to get that information, we'd have to have pre and post studies. And these sightings, as we know, are, um, are otter spotter, they're sightings. They're not, they're not um, people going out and doing uh, surveys. So those are, oops. Why is that not working? Those are the main reasons that people are interested in um, our Otter Spotter project. And there are a lot of reasons to understand how uh, an animal that's not particularly well known or particularly understood, they're a little bit elusive to find. It's really surprising how little basic information is known about river otters, but we are working on that. And uh, we have 17,000 river otter videos to prove it. <laughs> so here's one of them. And uh, this is an otter in, I think this otter is in Martinez. But one of the things that we've really noticed about river otters is that they're so comfortable in urban areas. And they are literally all over the Bay Area. Look at this one hanging out by this guy with his little dog. And I'm so happy to see the guy is doing exactly what he should, just sitting there chill, holding on to his dog, making sure it doesn't fuss with the otter. But um, river otters literally are all over the Bay Area. And if you take a look at our otter spotter map, you will see that they're in all of our cities, um, Oakland, San Francisco, uh, Richmond, uh, everywhere. You'll, you'll find them in almost every city in the Bay Area, except maybe, um, maybe Pacifica. <laughs> but um, our Bay Area cities, as we know, are excruciatingly vulnerable to climate change and the issues that come from that, like sea level rise and pollution of land, pollution of water, and more. So our goal is to find ways to use otter presence to connect our super urban communities to conservation planning and goals and outcomes. And now I'm going to play a Contra Costa otter. Look at that. 
amazing. They, they, uh, river otters are like humans, adaptable, and they will live in really urban places and be perfectly happy to do so as long as they have um, good, uh, a good source of, of prey species. So we decided to look into engaging community leaders in our work, especially in urban areas, including cultural, political, governmental, and educational leaders. We want to engage communities. We want to find out what community needs and conservation goals are, engage the right partners, bridge cultural and economic barriers to participation in, in um, community science. And we want to plan and carry out conservation activities based on those community needs and goals. So that's a really big new initiative for us. We're taking a turn from doing basic science, basic education to doing some much more multicultural and really interesting projects based on the, um, the connection between the urban and the wild. That is, I feel like that is such a rich connection that we can mine to continue to support our planet. So we're just getting started on this initiative with a pilot project in Marin, and we'll be working out, uh, we're, we're doing a couple of activities with young people this summer, including a tall ship learning experience on San Francisco Bay, and also exploring very local neighborhood waterways with an underwater ROV, which we were gifted some years ago, and with, um, uh, bathoscopes, which are little scopes that let you look into the water. So at the same time, we've partnered with the Institute of Integrative Conservation at College of William and Mary to provide us with support in the form of advisors and a year-long intern to help us prepare a roadmap for ourselves and for other small nonprofits to leverage our abilities in partnership with underserved communities. So our idea is to get the otters working for us all in community directed ways and do it in ways that are effective and scalable. So I love this um, photo, this video. Again, it shows the Contra Costa Canal otters playing on the ladder and just providing all of us with great fun as well as fun for themselves. Otters are fun. They play all their lives. Adults play with pups. Adults play with adults. They're pretty spectacular in that way. So new initiatives really excite us. And that's why we started River Otter Ecology Project. This is our 10th year in business. And we are really happy and thrilled to be here. We hope to stay just like the river otters. We will celebrate our 10th anniversary at Hans Faden Vineyards, which has river otters in Calistoga. And if you would like to join us, we'd love to see you there. It's on May 1st, so you don't have too much time. Um, we have about 10 or 10 tickets left, maybe something like that. And you can check out our website if you're interested in joining us. Now with that, I think we have time for a few more images and videos, because I know what you're really here for. And then I'm sure you'll have questions. I'll put a link. Um, so let me just go on. I'm gonna start with this one. It's very common for us to see bobcats on our trail cameras. Very common for us to see interactions between bobcats and otters. Now these animals weigh about the same, but a bobcat will never fight with a river otter. Their jaws are so tough and so strong that they don't want to mess with them. And as you see here, this was a mother river otter. So she's going to be extra fierce in protection of her young. This is in October, late October. So these young were, were not baby babies anymore. They're sort of teenage otters, but um, river otters are protective at all times. This one I love. This is two groups of otters meeting for the first time. And the one group is a mother, a sister, and their assorted related pups. 
And the second group climbing up is a different group of otters and they have not met before. So you see how curious they are, very curious, not fighting. They, I'm sure they've all smelled each other. Otters are, have, are very scent sensitive. So they know who each other are, but they're being a little careful. You see the pups are leaving. They're saying, well, we're gonna, we're gonna wait till we know these otters better. So I love interactions like that are fascinating. This, is, this um, video is from um, Sea Ranch. It's amazing. That is as steep of a cliff as it looks. There's a mother otter pulling her pretty small pups up the very steep cliff and the animal behind them, the large otter behind them is a helper female. Um, river otters don't hang up out with males that much uh, except when they're mating, but they do hang out with related females and often bring their pups up together. So I just love that video. River otters often have their pups um, up in uh, high above water because when they're born, they're not really able to swim at all and they don't want them to get swept out in flooding. So this one was a fox who came up and startled that otter. And then the otter suddenly realized that that was just a fox and turned and chased it away. Poor little fox doesn't look so good. This one is very interesting. The mouth of um, the Russian river. And you see there's an otter on the rocks with a gull that he had caught and was eating. And here's the young harbor seal, highly interested in this. And look how tiny that otter is in comparison to the seal head and in, in comparison to the gull. River otters weigh about um, 15 to 22, 25 pounds tops. They're long, but they're very narrow. So this went on for a while, the otter and the um, young harbor seal swimming around each other, being wary, but not aggressive. Finally, in the end, the otter got bored and moved upstream. And I think, I think this um, video was taken by folks from the Sonoma County, County Water Agency who were doing a harbor seal study at that time. And they sent me the video, which I'm very grateful for. Now, this is a series of photos. This is at my site, Abbott's Lagoon in Point Reyes National Seashore. The um, otters there are a very happy, well-fed and comfortable group and they are neighbors with coyotes. Now the otters and the coyotes don't mess with each other too much. I've seen many interactions among them. And here, Wiley Coyote is doing what he does. River otters can cache their food. So the, the river otters had gone out, they had caught several coots and had cached them in the lagoon there. And the coyote, of course, being so smart, decided he would go down and raid the larder. So the river otters were not pleased, as you can imagine. And here's the matriarch of the clan finally saying, I've had it. And she chased the coyote off. And look at the size difference between these two. But nobody messes with otters. They're, like, they're kind of like honey badgers. And they are in the same family. 
So I love that. And here's another interaction between a small um, predator and a large predator. So this bald eagle saw this otter had dragged in the fish and thought maybe it would share. And the otter said, no way, that's not happening. I don't care how big you are, I'm fiercer. And look at the musculature on that animal. They are small, they're thin, but they're incredibly strong critters. So that um, bald eagle was intelligently swimming off with the otter in hot pursuit. And that was that. Off goes the bald eagle. The bald, the bald eagle, I think, ended up coming back and getting part of that fish, but um, it was chased off for quite a long time by that otter. And finally, here are some animals that otters actually are afraid of. If, <laughs> if you look at the bottom of the screen, you see a little river otter. This just came in from Talia Rose, who's a wonderful photographer on the Eel River. And she had caught this otter um, running toward those geese and the geese sort of being scared, but then the geese got angry as geese will and chased the otter off. It's the only time I've ever seen an otter back down from anything. They're pretty, pretty amazing. And I'm, I'm finishing up with um, this slide and then a short video. And this I love because this is in Tamales Bay. It's the first time, as far as I know, that these two river otters in the front of the screen had ever met a sea otter. So the sea otter came floating by as they sometimes do and the otters raced out to visit it and they followed it around the point. And after a while, the river otters returned but the sea otter continued on its way. So that was very, very fun sighting for us. And I'm going to finish up with this um, beautiful video animation that tells a good story about otters. Life in the Northern California watershed is a shared proposition. The system is complex and easily unbalanced. Once believed to be extinct, the return of the charismatic river otter, ambassador of our watershed, is a beacon of hope to encourage continuing wetland restoration and conservation. Balancing this fragility is the responsibility of us all. So we're so grateful to Peter Coyote and Little Fluffy Clouds for such a beautiful um, presentation. And of course, to our otter spotters, to our photographers, to everyone who has supported Otter Spotter for all of these years. And thank you to you all for hosting me today. I, I will stop sharing now and um, move on to questions, I think. Wow, thank you, Megan. That I thank you so much for sharing the beauty and the majesty and the ferociousness of these little, little river otters. Um, I just 
as a, as a zoologist, I always had a fond spot for muscalids because they're just, they're cute, they're charismatic, they're smart, they're cuddly, and they will kill things five times their size. Um, it's like a ferret, right? You know, like you think they're just these cute pets, but you don't cross them um, and you always want to be on their good side unless there's a, go a goose, then, then we all <laughs> run because I hate to tell you, I'm, I'm a terrified of geese, geese as well. Uh, yeah, right, everyone. I, I have trauma from being young, being attacked by a goose. Um, so thank you so much. I, I really love um, having the opportunity to host you and learn all about otters in our, our environment. Um, I do want to thank you, Megan Isidore, and the River Ecology Project, and everyone out there that joined us in our community tonight to learn about otters. Saw a couple board members, saw a couple donors, saw a couple friends. Um, thank you all for coming and for participating. Um, you can keep engaged with the Sonoma Land Trust um, through our social media accounts and all sorts of other things. Um, you can uh, see our past presentations and download educational materials at our Nature at Home page on our website. And you can keep an eye out for our monthly Language of the Land webinar series at sonomalandtrust.org slash outings. We will get to our question and answer session shortly, so please do not go anywhere. Um, please submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We've got a couple lined up already, but we can always use a few more. Uh, I do want to just point out that Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on your donations from individuals and businesses and foundations to make our work possible. Uh, if you would like to, uh, what you heard today, please consider donating. Your gift helps support the land protection and preservation. You can always go to our website to donate. And I would also like to point out that the River Otter Project is also a nonprofit. Um, and we all, you know, I'm always a firm believer in rising sea, uh, this all boats. So um, please consider uh, a generous donation to both. Um, we will be moving on to our Q&A session next, and we'll be doing that for approximately half an hour or until the questions run out. Um, we have a few ready to go if you're ready, Megan. But before I begin, um, you know, I have a couple questions. One is a fun question. One's an actual question. One is, um, you know, during right after the fires, I'm not sure, not right after the fires, right after the pandemic started in 2020, uh, everything got so quiet. And and the people were all gone. And one of our employees at the Land Trust, Lisa Seagraves actually, got this beautiful photo of this family of otters playing in, I think it's Santa Rosa Creek um, in the middle of town. It just goes right to what you're talking about that otters don't mind urbanization, although I'm sure they prefer not, but they do, they do make their way. And it, it was as close as the Sonoma Land Trust has ever gotten to going viral because people just loved it and they loved seeing these animals and they came out when the people weren't there. Um, and of course, the biologist said, well, they're always there. They just happen to be there at night, usually in the middle of town. Um, and so do you see a lot of otters in urban centers like Santa Rosa? I mean, there's 250,000 people living there. Absolutely. Downtown Santa Rosa. Um, if you go to our otter spotter map, and click on the, the little thing that says, um, uh, go to larger map, then you can zoom in to all kinds of places and you can click on those little yellow dots and you'll get information about each of those sightings. So absolutely, downtown Santa Rosa, downtown Martinez, um, in uh, Lake Temescal, in um, the East Bay, there, there are otters all over. We've even had, we've even seen them a couple times in San Francisco, although oh, wow. not inland San Francisco, but along the dock area. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the key thing about river otters is that they are adaptable, 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 and they're not afraid of anything. So they'll go anywhere that there's food. <laughs> That's great. Uh, before we jump into some questions, there's a couple just comments I just want to highlight. You know, people have talked about they're seeing um, the Hans Vineyard that you mentioned. You know, they Hans saw, Baden. Yep, they, they're a neighbor and they saw the, the otters in the creek right after the Tubbs fire. And I'm wondering if other people have seen otters right after the fire. Um, we, have, we got a few sightings shortly after fires, but um, not a lot, a few. Okay. And there's someone else that mentioned, you know, they see them in the uh, right outside of Sebastopol in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Oh, yes. So there's a lot of otters out there. I mean, it, it's yes, a, that's a perfect. Swamp, right? 
Yeah, yeah, perfect otter territory. There are otters all over the San Francisco Bay Area, all over Sonoma, all over Marin, um, all over Napa. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your, your love of otters because I think we, we all love them. All right, I'm gonna start with a question that I think is a natural question from the last couple of slides you had, which is river otters, sea otters. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the difference? Oh, sure. River otters and sea otters are the two species of otters we have in North America in, and in California. So um, river otters are small, they're cousins, but of all the 13 species of otters, river otters and sea otters are the most different. River mm -hmm. otters need fresh water. They can live anywhere from mountains all the way down to the coastline. They love all kinds of water. They're not picky eaters. They're very adaptable. Sea otters, not so much. They're also small. They weigh about 20 pounds. Sea otters are huge. So if you're down at Elkhorn Slough and you go kayaking, you'll see how really big they are. They um, weigh about 65 to 75 or more pounds. They're very, very fierce, even though they look sweet and cuddly, very fierce animals. You don't really want them on your kayak, particularly. <laughs> um, uh, and they can spend their whole lives at sea. They're very different from river otters. So river, sea otters can easily be born at sea and never come to land. They're clumsy on land. They um, are really where they're adapted for is the ocean, whereas river otters are really um, good at doing things like climbing trees and going across land and, and rocks they, and cliffs <laughs> and climbing cliffs. Yeah, they can do all of that. Yeah. And I know that they're they're both muscolids, but that's about where it ends. And so the family is actually different for those Latin nerds among us, which is probably just me, to be honest. Uh, you know, I had a, a a family story that everyone loved. My parents loved to tell is when we were fishing up in Tahoe in the Tahoe Basin out in Hope Valley, and we were catching all these trout. And I was a little kid, and we'd hang them up on the little stick, and they were hanging them up. And every time we caught a fish, and went back, there was less fish. We went back, <laughs> fish, and we went back. Where are our fish going? And at some point, we pretended to fish and just watch. And sure enough, this, these two sea, these two river otters would poke out, see us, and come over and rip a, a fish off the stick, and they are taken <laughs> off with our fish. They're Apparently, my dad sure. loves to tell that story. He makes it a little bit more embarrassing for me, usually. Uh, <laughs> lots of lovely stories coming in, seeing otters in Santa Rosa Creek by Stony Point, um, up in Sacramento, seeing them in the Western Drainage Canals during Sacramento near the airport. Again, you know, it's, it's, they're not afraid of that urbanization, and I think it's, it must be a, a positive for the species, at least. It is, it is a positive for them because um, they are one of the species that is able to live among us. And it makes it even more important for us to welcome them and treat them with respect. Like we should be treating all wildlife, raccoons and skunks and fox and all the species that can do fine in our, in our um, cities. All right, I got a question since you're the, the most river otter expert I have ever met. So you talked about Mrs. Fierce or Miss Fierce. Um, we don't know, I guess we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, how do you tell them apart? Is this oh, like a whale it. with like a fluke and you can see the little difference or like they all kind of look like furry little brown mammals to me. How do you tell them apart? That's a great question. And it brings up, um, it leads to the way we do our research. You can't tell them apart really. So when I talk about Mrs. Fierce, I'm talking about an otter that we, we have a, a um, array of uh, cameras up on a hundred mile stretch of coastline in Marin County. So our coast and water line in Marin. And we, that's our monitoring program. So we use those cameras to count otters, see if their population numbers are increasing, decreasing or staying the same, see if they're successfully raising young and all of the behavior, all of those sorts of things. So that's what we use our cameras for, but we can't tell them one from another on our camera. The only time we think that we can tell them is if there's a mother with pups and she stays in that same area for a season. So that's why we know who Mrs. Fierce is. She's bringing food to her pups and we're seeing her on camera week after week after week. Um, so we have, we have counted the otters along this hundred mile stretch for 10 years. 
And this kind of points to the fact that because we can't tell one otter from the other, we, our count is off. It's not accurate, but we know that. So the important thing when you're doing a science project like that is to make sure you continue to count in the same way year after year after year, and you have a reasonable expectation of at least knowing whether the population is increasing or decreasing. So that's what we do. And we count our population as the most number of otters we see on that camera at one time. And it's probably a little bit of an undercount. I, I really appreciate that. Again, as someone that, you know, as a biology undergrad and we at the Land Trust, we have science education programs, especially for teens and they do their own research. And I think your focus on real hard data-driven primary source research is just so inspiring and helpful. And I really appreciate that work you do because you know, just taking pictures of otters, that's the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get into the, the details of counting and coding and actually start looking at what the data is telling you. And I think it's just so powerful. And I really appreciate you adding to that information because unfortunately, a lot of science has to follow the money. And there's not a lot of money to focus on otters right now because they're not an endangered species. But I think they're, it, they're absolutely, like your point is, is they're a, an indicative species of, of uh, watershed health. Yes, and, and, they, and because they're so charismatic, they're a great species to encourage um, people to care about wildlife and to care about learning what science is. And that's why, that's why we really enjoy our projects it, our, with the high school students, because they love it. They love seeing otters. They, who doesn't love going kayaking and seeing otters, right? So, Who doesn't like looking at videos of cute fuzzy otters jumping around all day? Yeah, but then they they also have to do science. I mean, these, these are students who are learning science and they're learning what science is. And having an animal like that that's really fun to look at and learn about is it's just gold for Absolutely. teaching them. Yeah. Um, moving on, our, our next question is from Anne, and it, it's really about drought and how that affects otters. So she says, um, how far do otters travel in drought years? We've seen them this spring in areas here in Vacaville. Wow, bringing people from Vacaville. Thanks for joining us. Um, that was completely dry last summer. Can you talk about how the drought has been impacting otters? Sure. Um, otters are are very able to move around. They can go 25 miles between watersheds across land if they want to. And they what they generally do is follow waterways. So if somewhere, and we watched this last summer, um, some of our sites, especially in Point Reyes, really went dry early this year. And otters just move. They go to where they can find water and food. They, they just go to where they're gonna go. And one of the things that we realized during these drought years is that otters go everywhere. We had thought, okay, they're gonna stay. We had read in all the papers and all the books, otters have a five to seven kilometer um, area that they stay in. And we thought as the, as the years go by and we do this work, we're thinking, you know, no. <laughs> the otters go wherever they want and they'll travel if they need to. So as far as drought goes, it is a detriment to them to have to move. So we, we saw that the otter, I don't know if it's Mrs. Fierce or a different otter, but the otter who have, has been living at that site had three pups this year and she moved them early in the season to a place where there was perhaps more water, or it could have been a project that was going on there at the same time. But in any case, none of those three pups survived their first season. And what we did notice in the place she moved them to was that probably because of the drought, the coyotes were hanging out at that stream a lot more. And I think it's very likely that the coyotes got those pups, which is really too bad. When they're really stressed and not, not having the, the water resources they need. And then, you know, that brings up a, an interesting observation. When you, when you showed the updated range map with CDFW, uh, there were these pockets of otters up in the Sierras. They looked over like Yosemite. And I'm curious about, you know, have you thought about or have you done any genetic studies looking at, is there genetic drift between them? Are they becoming specialized or is their range so you know, lit fluid that they're moving that far up from the Sierras down and up. 
I doubt that they would move that far as to come down to the coast from the Sierras, at least not in, in one lifetime. Yeah. There, there might be some kind of drifting of, of members of populations, but we have not done any of those genetic studies. We, uh, I have to tell you all, we are a tiny organization. There are two of us <laughs> who work full time on these projects and we have volunteers who do our field work with us. Mm -hmm. So um, getting the resources to do those kinds of studies is high on our list of things we'd like to do. Yeah. Yeah. Science, man, it's always limited by the by the resources because it's never limited yes. by the curiosity. I'll tell you that. Never limited by curiosity. <laughs> you, have, you have the two of us just like, oh, what about this question and this question and this question? I know. Um, all right, how about an easy question? What is the best time to see an otter? If I'm going to take my 20 month old baby out, and I'm like, I'm going to go, we're going to see an otter. What's time's the best time? I think any time is a great time to see an otter. <laughs> no, seriously, otters are um, most active at dusk and dawn and at night, but they can also be seen at any time of the day. So whenever you're out near a waterway, keep your eyes open for big ripples on the surface and lots of bubbles because they have that thick, thick fur. So when they dive, those bubbles come out of their fur and you see lots of them. And you can a lot of times just follow them by their bubbles. Oh, cool. I keep sneaking my own personal questions in here because I, I really like this stuff. That's why I'm hosting tonight. Um, question about your otter spotter mm -hmm. and and you said you've worked with the academy of sciences of which i that was my previous career um and i think some of my teens at the academy actually used to do some of the necropsy or the preparation for the skeletons of, of dead otters um actually i know they did um have you looked at connecting otter spotter observation data with iNaturalist, which is a part of California Academy of Sciences? And how do you do you use their data and port it into otter spotter or vice versa? Or is there anything there? No, there is no connection between us at this time. And we did think about it when we started our project. And we talked to the INAP folks who are just amazingly wonderful people. And we, we said, you know, is, can this work for us? But at that time, it did not work for us. That was 10 years ago when they were beginning. And we do have a project on INAT. So, so um, if information comes in that we don't have, um, we use it. But actually, I don't think we've I don't think they have anything that we don't have at this time. Um, but we do, of course, keep an eye on it because, yeah. wow, what a great engine for yeah. um, community science. And the, the AI they're working on and the machine learning is just, it's does some really cool science. And I'm, I'm excited to hear that you're, you're keeping an eye on it and seeing how this can work together. Absolutely. Um, question from Jean about identifying otters. Go back to that question real quick. Uh, recently heard about some technology that can distinguish between individuals based on tracks and you're nodding. So yes. That have, is have you used this technology or are you considering it? We, we haven't used it. It's not perfected yet. Um, the, uh, there, the folks who are doing that work, and there's more than one, there's more than one group doing that kind of work. Um, got in touch with us and they said, we really want to do this with you. And we said, we really want to do this with you, but we can't, we do not have time. We don't have the staff to get that all together. However, they were able to find some people in England, um, the IOSF, who they're working with for, um, it's a different species, but it's the same technology. And they, they will make it happen. And I think also in Maryland, some of the river otter folks are gonna work on that with them. So sooner or later, we'll be able to use that um, kind of technology to tell otters one from another. All right, it, so keep, an, so eye out, keep an eye on it and we'll, 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 we'll hold across our fingers and hope. Yeah, you should have them come and talk. That would, be, yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah. Um, all right, yes or no? Do otters get along with beavers? <laughs> well, otters, yeah, otters don't care about beavers and beavers don't really care for otters. Oh. And that, that is because otters are always happy to go into beaver dens, yes. uh, into bank dens if they can get into them. And if they can get um, beaver kits, oh. they will take them. So beavers, but beavers are not at all scared of otters. Yeah. There are another species that otters don't really mess with. They just slap their tails and the otters take off. So as, as far as I know, I've never heard of any kind of um, lethal interaction between a beaver and an otter. We do, have, we do have a hilarious video of 
an otter at Martinez. He's just lying there hanging out at night and it's dark. And suddenly he, his head goes up and he looks out and you kind of hear this lumbering noise coming up the bank. And here backlit by the lights comes this giant beaver. And the otter goes, I know, lumbering along. Do, 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 do. It's so silly on land. <laughs> It's so great. And the otter takes off as though it's Godzilla coming after him. It's super. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's interesting because their, their habitat type overlaps so much. That fresh yes. water and the pools. And as a young, as a child, the most river I ever saw were up in the Sierras at, and usually around old beaver dams. And they weren't usually active, but, you know, they, they liked the water and they were around it. Yeah. They were yeah. around it. Yeah, beavers are great. We got a question about from a, a naturalist. Uh, Leah um, seems to be putting some hours in um, for her, her naturalist hours. And she was wondering, she's been uh, watching from an undisclosed location uh, in an area of Yolo County for 10 years. And they're, uh, but she's really looking for a project that maybe might provide a little bit more interaction with otters. Is that something that's going on out there? Is that something that you can direct people to resources about? Well, we um, we don't we don't encourage actual interaction with otters, but we do have um, volunteers. You have to be unfortunately in Marin County or willing to go to Marin County to be a volunteer with our camera trapping program. So we have trained volunteers who go out and um, service the cameras once a week during our trap our monitoring season, which is June through October, November. And it's really fun when we collect um, samples, we collect some samples for um, bacterial analysis and also for our uh, genetic analysis at that same time. And mm -hmm. we have a training program, we have mentors, it's very, very fun. So I think if people are interested in that, you can go to our website and you can um, sign up on the website. Can you there give your website one more time? There was someone that was asking. It's riverotterecology.org riverotterecology.org. That's Wonderful. right. Yep. Um, Nick asked a question that is perfect. It's teeing me up to squeeze in some of Sonoma Land Trust strategic plan and focus areas in there. And it's about um, some areas in the Sonoma Valley and otters. So what can you share about otter activity in Glen Ellen, Sonoma Creek, as well as Graham Creek in the north up to Jack London State Park, as well as, and this is the part that's important for us, any activity in the Sonoma Developmental Center, which Sonoma Land Trust is working to help protect the wild spaces, the non-developed spaces for the wildlife corridor, that, that narrows band that comes in that allows for movement of animals or genetic drift and all that kind of stuff between the Mayakamas and Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, so is there otter activity in the Sonoma Valley? Sure there is. And that's what I was talking about during, can I share a screen? Well, I can't actually do that again. But um, that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier when I was talking about advocacy. Mm -hmm. So there are certainly otters who are using that area. They go down um, the streams all the way down to San Pablo Bay. They use all of those streams. And if you check out our map online, you will, um, you will see all the otter spaces. And that's why we, we did feel that we were able to um, send in a comment letter on that, on that issue. And Thank yes, you. absolutely. We need to protect <laughs> our corridors for every yeah. good reason there is. Yeah, and it's not just otters, it's all of the animals that- All been. species, yeah. all plants. And it's important. And again, the Sonoma Land Trust is in support of responsible, affordable housing there. And I think we can balance it with some strong protections for our wildlife. Absolutely. Not exclusive. Yeah. Um, all right. We've got five minutes and a bunch of questions. So let's let's do this lightning round style. How many pups do they normally have in a year? What age do they become sexually mature? And do they remain in family groups for life? Zoology question. I love it. That is like Two to five. <laughs> okay. Two and four. And okay. no. <laughs> so right. they they have two they usually have two or three pups but they can have up to six but we generally see two or three or four they um males and females don't hang out together unless they're mating females um are usually seen in social groups with their pups or they can be quite happy by themselves they can also be with related females and their associated pups so again adaptability um to their in their social groups males are 
perfectly happy alone. They're also perfectly happy in big bro groups of <laughs> river otter males. And when you see a group of 10, 12, 14 river otters, it's usually a group of males. A group of boys all hanging out. That, I love these super nerdy naturalist questions you all are asking, so keep them coming. Uh, like speaking of which, and, and bro groups in your terms, um, I know that happens with the giant river otters in Brazil. And so someone asked about, they saw giant river otters in Brazil and they make incredible vocalizations. Do our river otters make vocalizations? Yes, they have many different vocalizations and it, they can range from growls to screams to chirps. They, their contact calls sound like little birds. They also make a really interesting um, noise that's called a chuckle. And it's, it sounds like this, I'll do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> and that's usually a greeting sound or they can also make it when they're a little nervous as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, Linda asks, lifespan? Lifespan in the wild, 10 to 12 years approximately. They lose their teeth and then they can't eat and then they die. Yes. It's, it's really, it's pretty brutal like a lot of wildlife lives are. Like uh, opossums. They just, they don't really get old and die. They just kind of get old and fall apart. <laughs> and it's just part of nature. That's how their bodies go. What about sea otters? How, long, how old do sea otters live? Sea otters? Oh, gosh. That's a good question. I don't know it right off the top of I think my it's head. it's longer, but I'm not, don't quote me on that. I know. Well, river otters in zoos can live to be 16, 18, 20 wow. years old. Yeah. It's, it's just that, you know, it's a tough life to live out there in the wild and have to eat a hundred times a day in order to stay alive. It's high calorie intakes. I'm going to combine a couple questions and it's about um, otters and dams and that kind of ecological interaction. So there's a proposal to remove a power generator dam in the Yellow River. There's someone else that asked some questions about removal of dams in, in Northern California. Um, would that be a positive for otters or is that a negative? And one of the other comments was mentioning that in the in the the brief to sue pg e they're actually citing otters as a as a harm as a negative that they were um, eating in this legal document that they were eating endangered endangered salmonids um, and they were saying that that's a that's a hazard and that they need to remove the dam because the otters were eating the, the salmon um, so can you talk a little bit about otters and dams and is it generally good or bad I know that's probably um, a really big question that doesn't have enough science. Well, dam dams in general are bad for wildlife, as we know, because they stop the natural processes that should be happening to move um, woody debris downstream and, and other things downstream and to allow salmon to go upstream and downstream. And um, so dams, you know, not great. River otters don't care that much about processes unless they affect them. So for example, river otters in Lagunitas Creek, which is heavily dammed, are perfectly happy to be there. There's lots of crayfish for them. Um, so in general, not dams are, I would, wouldn't say in general, they affect them. If dams are moved or removed, otters are very adaptable. Yeah. And generally the positives for dam removal are so great as far as species improving that that can do nothing but be better for otters because lots more species for them to eat, yeah. <laughs> basically, to put it really simply. Absolutely. All right. Hardest question. Megan, what is your favorite thing about otters? Oh. I know. That's hard to ask someone that's like a, an otter nerd. Yeah. Um, my favorite thing about otters. I can, I can say what I always say, which is that they connect people to wildlife. And that is one of my favorite things about them. But I'm such a wildlife nerd, really. I love all wildlife. There, there are a few wild animals that I don't like. I don't my like. favorite, they're little fingers. They're, 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 fingers. They're, so, they're so tactile. And they can they are very tactile. Very little things. And I, I've met a, an Asian otter, sea otter, a river otter once, and he could just like, do these little things and it's just so cute and they're just oh like, yeah a clawless yeah. otter mm -hmm. yeah our otters have major big claws oh do they the North American river otters have webbed feet and very big strong claws oh yeah. so I had a clawless otter grabbing my finger and saying hi so don't do that with a local otter Got no <laughs> <laughs> well Megan it has been such a pleasure talking with you tonight and I know so many people enjoy it we had well over 150 people here tonight, all to hear about otters and the Otter Ecology Project. Thank you for spending your time with us this evening. 
Thank you for anything. Is there anything you want to say to anyone before we sign off? Um, I want to say to Kelly Hunt that she, you should look on our range map um, for a range map of the entire United States, and you'll see where we've got otter sightings from. But there are other range maps as well. There's also a, um, a, a whole North American one on Wikipedia. FYI. Right. Yes. It's yes. Um, that's all. I have really enjoyed it. It's been a fun time. Thank you all for being here. Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it, Megan. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure to stay in touch. Well, thank you all in the audience for coming. You'll get an email that has some follow-up. It has some resources. Um, it has some links to some various activities. There's also a survey to let us know how we did. If you liked it, if you didn't, if there's something you want to learn about in the future, let us know. We're always here. Um, and have a wonderful night. We're at 8.30. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.